Hello everyone and welcome to the GIS Smart Webinar Series. Choices and Voices Explore, Adapt, Impact. An engaging series to share happenings in the field of digital pedagogy at GIS. Here we meet and talk to pioneers from the edtech industry and expert educators from our own school who have invaluable hands-on experience and are actively involved in shaping the digital citizens of tomorrow. We welcome you today to episode one of the series, Smart Education for the Future Beyond Tomorrow. I'm your host, Arjun, and I have with me Ms. Deepika. We have with us a special guest, uh, Mr. Patrick, who has joined us from the US. A very warm welcome to our special guest. Patrick Marcotte is an educator, edtech leader, and consultant. He is the former president of multiple educational technology and publishing companies based in the US. With over 15 years of development, implementation, and executive leadership experience in education, he has worked to build some of the most awarded and most widely used educational products globally. In addition to his experience in the private sector, Patrick's work has spanned in the areas of community and behavior driven based uh, safety, psychiatric, rehabilitation, assessment design, and software architecture. Patrick received his MA in Applied Behavioral Analysis from the Chicago School and studied psychology and economics as an undergraduate at Hofstra University in New York. Thank you, Arjun. Welcome, Mr. Patrick. So digital pedagogy, as the name suggests, it's like combining pedagogy with technology. Pedagogy is the driver and technology the accelerator. At GIIS, we are continually striving to be in tune with the changing pace of educational world. We are right now busy preparing digital citizens of tomorrow who will take over this globalized world. As very rightly said now, technology is like oxygen. We don't just need it, we breathe it all the time. The new civilization is actually expecting us to adopt technology, not as a luxury, as a necessity in all aspects of human activity, including education. So keeping in pace with the rapidly changing and accelerated globalized digital world, we are moving in tune. And that's why we have with us Mr. Patrick today and let's hear from him what he says, how educational trends have changed over the years, how pandemic has affected the way we are looking at the future of education and how smart the education would be in times to come. Over to you, Mr. Patrick. All right, well, thank you so much for welcoming me to the program today. And thank you so much for the warm introduction. Uh, my name is Patrick Marcotte, and I've had a, the, the pleasure to work with Global Schools Foundation over the last year or so on a number of different applications uh, that uh, that we're excited to, to roll out in the next couple of years. And some of the presentation today will touch on some of the themes and some of the items that we've been working on. Uh, but more importantly, I think we're going we're gonna to really focus on the changing educational landscape in the context of a changing global landscape. So without further ado, let's go ahead and, and jump into the presentation. Um, I'm going to start with a quote from uh, Min Zhu, who's the Deputy Managing Director of the International Monetary Fund, the IMF. And this is from the 2015 Global Economic Outlook Forum in, in Davos. He said, people will remember this as the year emerging markets take half the global GDP. That's an important milestone in our civilization because for a while, uh, the sort of developed countries and, uh, you know, a handful of countries were really driving the economic agenda. And as a result, the, uh, the, the uh, financial agenda, the educational agenda, and the social agenda, really for the rest of the world to, uh, to look at and follow in some ways. And I think that now we're seeing this change. Over the course of the last five years, um, as somebody who's worked in a lot of different parts throughout the world, I've, I've seen it happen, and it's happening quickly. And the pace of the change is continuing to accelerate. Let's take a look at some data that, uh, that, that tells us a little bit about this change in some sort of empirical uh, terms. So, for example, talking about the changing educational world, which is a result of the changing nature of influence in, in the country and will in turn change who has influence uh, throughout the world, really. Uh, so this is uh, India's uh, educational attainment 
from 1970 to what's predicted in 2050. And as we can see from this chart, India is the fastest growing educated population in the world with more people becoming uh, educated to a point of uh, secondary education at least and then eventually post-secondary. I think these estimates on post-secondary education might be uh, on the lower side, but we're still talking about hundreds of millions of additional people entering the educated workforce, which will uh, change, uh, is going to change the world, um, undoubtedly. Now, we'll take a look at some other countries for, uh, for context. And if we take a look at the U.S., for example, who has in some cases been considered a standard bearer in, in education, uh, I think we're going to see that change uh, over the next uh, few years, certainly over the next 20 or 30 years as the, as the global populations change. You can see that the rate of education change in the U.S. is relatively slow. For a country that uh, has a history and a reputation for being innovative, we have a real innovation uh, crisis in some ways here because we're, uh, we're, we haven't seen a whole lot of educational change and we're not seeing a ton of change in terms of the, uh, the profile of the population and moving to higher levels of education. It's a fairly stagnant educational landscape uh, in, in the U.S. Now, of course, there are uh, lots of changes and innovations that are coming out, but the rate of change and the rate of innovation and, and change in uh, the educational landscape is um, certainly slower than, than maybe uh, has been considered in the past. Let's take another a look at another country, a uh, major uh, power in the world, China. Uh, right now has uh, the most educated people in the world, according to you know, looking at secondary education, but that's not going to last. We can see that the predictions are that uh, because of a variety of, of policies, uh, that the population might be in decline. Uh, and while the share of the population that has no education is it's relatively small and is continuing to shrink, uh, we are seeing overall that there will be a lower number of people who are well-educated in China, uh, certainly than uh, what we can expect to see uh, in, in India. And this trend gets to, uh, is amplified, the differences are amplified when we start to look at places in, in Africa. And so this is Zambia, just one country in Africa, but this is a consistent story uh, that you could see if you take a look at the, our world of data. Uh, this is from the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis, uh, taking a look at human population, human capital in the 21st century. These are some of their uh, estimates and analyses based on a variety of data sets. Uh, but we can see just a real explosion of, one, the population, but also in the educated uh, population. And so you can see the growth in the population that's age 0 to 14, and that's the area uh, down here in, in the graph. Um, but just a, a really rapid acceleration of, uh, of individuals who are increasingly going to be educated and have a demand, uh, have an interest, a, a thirst uh, to, uh, to learn. Um, so this, these are just some graphs that show the, uh, the change educational landscape in terms of educational attainment uh, really across the world, which is going to change the demand. And as soon as that demand changes, we can expect to see the, the kinds of programs and, and kind of tools and resources available change as well. Uh, as a result of that, uh, and uh, we'll kind of as we as we segue into another part of the uh, the presentation here, it's a, a great quote from Sharad uh, Segar, uh, entrepreneur, CEO of Dexterity Global. Uh, it's a learning uh, company uh, out of out of India. Uh, so the, the democratization of education is everyone's fight, everyone's right. I think this is perfectly said. Uh, a lot of people over the years who are influential in education have touched on the the major theme that the goal of education is ultimately to enlighten that, that next generation. And uh, the sort of democratization of education is something that has been talked about for, you know, for centuries now, and that has been the goal. And the idea is to, uh, to prepare students, not just for the jobs of tomorrow, but to create the jobs, to create the new societies, to become uh, civic leaders, um, you know, not just of tomorrow, but, you know, many, many generations uh, after that. And it really is everyone's fight and everyone's right. And I think that now we're going to see more populations, more countries and individuals with a voice. And we're going to see the markets uh, meeting that demand and meeting those changing expectations uh, for a, a more democratized uh, education. What does that look like? Well, we've heard about these for the last you know, maybe decade or so, perhaps a little bit longer. Uh, but the, the pandemic, as well as the, the global demand, has really changed the you know what it means to uh, uh, to have these sort of massive open online course environments. So talking about MOOCs, uh, you might have 100,000 students in a, in a MOOC uh, and you know, they're, they're open, anyone can, can register, uh, you can 
you know, go on and, and learn anything from computer science to project management to arts activities, uh, you know, art, artistic abilities, and so on. Uh, it's uh, online, of course, so the course will be delivered entirely over the internet. Oftentimes, there's no in-person uh, education, and uh, of course, you know, courses are uh, basically similar to college courses. Now, these, you know, the outcomes in MOOCs are are not great across the board um, just because it's available just because you can share the information doesn't mean that people are, are really learning as much as they should but there's um, a real opportunity to you know to improve the uh, kind of these massive open online educational environments but this is an example of what a democratized educational system might look like this is sort of an early indicator of what that changing educational world uh, might look like and no longer is it you know, just isolated courses. Uh, now we're seeing whole programs offered by some of the world's top uh, universities. You can see a, a finance program from Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT's finance department, computer science through NYU, uh, and so on and, and so forth. And it's uh, in addition to those uh, sort of degree programs, um, some of these new models include, you know, online master's degrees, micro master's programs where we're taking off, a, you know, but into a smaller piece of a, of a degree program uh, and allowing more students access to you know, learning really specialized skill sets and learning how to apply those specialized skill sets, professional certificates, uh, executive education, which is sorely needed uh, for the next uh, sort of cohort of business leaders around the world. Uh, a micro bachelor's program similar to the micro uh, masters and the X series programs, which are created by world renowned uh, experts in top universities and, and really focusing on a deep understanding of new modern, you know, sort of in demand uh, fields. Um, in addition to things like uh, large open uh, courseware type type environments, uh, we're seeing a lot of new technologies like artificial intelligence, natural language processing. A lot of the AI work in education has been focused so far on uh, most common areas, highest need areas, as we'd expect in places like language and in math. And right now, that's what AI seems to be pretty good at, is in helping to teach new languages, uh, develop languages, as well as teaching some fairly discrete skill sets, such as uh, such as math. Um, these are some of the, the larger current players in the AI space. Um, you know, Google Assistant, Google, of course, has a lot of AI and machine learning um, uh, projects underway. Uh, Duolingo is an educational application that uh, uh, actually teaches language through a uh, kind of a, a natural language processing uh, set of, of, of tools. Uh, Elsa, uh, you can see this sort of piece of marketing material here from Elsa. It says, meet Elsa, your personal AI-powered English speaking coach. Uh, speak English in short, fun dialogues. Get instant feedback from our proprietary artificial intelligence technology. We're going to see more and more of this. Uh, Talk to Learn and IBM Watson, of course, has been a player in the AI space for a little while. These are just some of the names that are becoming a little bit more familiar. Uh, but when it comes to, you know, what what is technology going to provide? What's a, what is the most direct impact on education? education going to be in the near term. It's going to be the advent and the um, commercialization of really robust and high quality, highly reliable artificial intelligence, NLP and, and machine learning uh, type, uh, type approaches, algorithms and so on, as well as the democratization of learning. And, and there's going to be a time when you don't have to attend a top university in order to, to receive a, a quality education. Um, but what we're going to learn as we talk a little bit more about some of the things we've seen during the pandemic uh, is that you know just the, having information and just simply having access to technology really isn't enough. And the pandemic you know, taught us that. So we'll we'll talk about that a little bit now. When it comes to predictions, a lot of people like to predict different trends and, and you know, where education is going to go. Um, and so this is an interesting quote: it "says books will soon be obsolete in the public schools. Our school system will be completely changed inside of ten years." Now, before I show you know who this was and, and when they said it. Try to think to yourself, you know, how long ago you think this was said? So what year do you think the person said this quote? And you know, who do you think it, it might be? It could, it could be anybody because it's been said so many times throughout history. Okay, so get that thought. Get your best guess that you possibly uh, can come up with. Okay, so this was Thomas Edison in 1913. That's the that's the answer here. So in 1913, the American inventor uh, was quoted was on record saying that books will be obsolete and our school system will be completely changed inside of 10 years. OK, 
Okay, it's been about 110 years now, and schools look pretty similar to the way they did, um, aside from the fact that many kids weren't in there uh, for a little while because of uh, because of the pandemic. But otherwise, you know, we don't see a whole lot of, of change necessarily uh, as a result of new technologies. And every time there's a new technology that comes out, there's a lot of promise that goes along with it. And it's not so much that it disappoints, but it doesn't replace things and it doesn't provide this wholesale monumental shift in the, in the way that people predicted that it could. Now, some new technologies might do that, um, but I, I think what we're learning is that there's something special about a really good school and something special about how a school can use technology. And it's that combination of the school, of the classroom, of the peer environment, and of the teachers uh, in that in those classrooms with the technology that really matters and how it drives the teaching as opposed to replacing the teaching. Um, so we'll get into that a little bit more. Now, and back to what we sort of learned from, from the pandemic. Now, educational technology with those companies that I just mentioned and with the MOOCs that are available and with the democratization that's under, uh, you know, sort of under, undertaken by, uh, by students all over, all over the world, um, you know, we would think that with the pandemic coming and shutting down schools that this would be a real opportunity to test out the quality of technology. So if technology really could take the place of, of educators, this would have been the opportunity to do so. Uh, this graph here from UNESCO uh, shows some of the uh, school closures, the durations of closures across the world, and the, uh, the darker uh, shaded colors here indicate um, upwards of 40 plus weeks. And in some places, we saw 50 or 60 weeks of, of no in-person schooling as a result of the pandemic. So if ever there was a time to test out just how much technology could do and whether or not technology could replace teachers and replace classrooms. This was the major, the big global experiment that technologists and technocrats were, uh, were waiting for. Uh, and, you know, as we'll find out, uh, the verdict is the verdict is in. Uh, we're not ready to get rid of technology. What we need to do is leverage it properly, effectively, and responsibly. Uh, what we learned from the pandemic, and this is a study commissioned by UNESCO as part of their Education 2030 project. Uh, so we saw that you know, some of the most important areas, you know, in today's changing world, what we need to do is empower students. We need to give students more of a voice uh, to become active participants, not just consumers of knowledge, but participants and change agents to drive the world that, that the rest of civilization needs. Uh, many of the, the top performers are going to be coming out of schools, uh, come, coming from uh, campuses within Global Schools Foundation. And so we need to provide students with these uh, most important skill sets, which include uh, what you get from collaboration and in changing and sort of making the world around you a better place, uh, whatever that world might be. We saw a 52% reduction in student governance. Uh, we saw a 50% reduction in community action, 49% reduction in volunteering and a 30% reduction in classroom discussion. Everything that we're doing is to position in education is to position students to be the leaders of the next generation. And throughout the pandemic, we saw that without the presence of classrooms and teachers and, and nurturing societies and communities around them, we saw huge reductions in some of the most important activities that are going to prepare students to go and lead us into the next, uh, into the future, into the next generation. Uh, some other statistics that we saw. So, what did we see uh, happen in uh, in this? This studies were uh, were focused on Europe, Middle East, and North African countries. Uh, but this is fairly indicative of really the rest of the world. Um, and we saw a, a huge increase in the amount of video. So we saw that teachers uh, were reporting 93.5% of teachers reported using online video lessons. So streaming themselves, um, uh, delivering the same lesson that they would have delivered otherwise only now through Zoom. So it was just like class only, uh, only through Zoom. 86.6% uh, uh, said they used social media to stay in touch with their students. And about 59% said the classes were less frequent. Uh, almost half, uh, 49% plus percent uh, said that there were some classes held outside of school, which is fine. And 42% uh, about uh, said that the class sizes were uh, were reduced. So these were really the changes that came. We had an opportunity for technology to really change education. Uh, and there weren't a whole lot of changes. We took a class and we 
put it on Zoom. We recorded the, the teacher uh, in front of the students instead of, uh, instead of the teacher just being there in, in front of students. But that's not the case everywhere. Uh, there are examples of, how, of really thoughtful schools, schools that were actually ready for, for technology shifts, that were already using technology, leveraging it in highly effective ways, and were already planning uh, to, you know, to find uh, better, more impactful ways to use the technology. Because the, you know, the, the schools that are going to succeed and the schools that will continue to prepare students for the future are the ones who understand the value of the educator, the value of community, the role that all of those interactions play in a healthy, successful uh, child, um, but also can leverage that and accelerate that growth through technology. Okay. And so overall, some of the, the takeaways, uh, what we learned uh, from, from the pandemic is that overall, school closures negatively affected academic growth. The closures in remote learning widened existing achievement gaps, especially in language and math, uh, arguably the two most important areas for our society. Uh, and educators have seen higher rates of mental health and other crises. This is all over the world. But the main takeaway point is that teachers, school cultures, and peer groups are critical to student success. We can't have a healthy educational ecosystem without those, uh, without those uh, pieces in play. Uh, another piece that we learned here, I sort of touched on this a little bit, is technology's limitations. And what we saw during the pandemic was, uh, according to some of the research that's been done, uh, the appeal of uh, conducting class in a reasonably familiar way has won out over bold visions to reimagine online teaching and learning. Um, you know, maybe we were thrust into a changing environment too quickly. Um, you know, it, it's hard to say. If we would have had 10 years to plan for the pandemic, would we have seen something different? I don't know that we would have, because um, you can see the predictions going back over 100 years were saying that things were going to change, that there would be bold visions to reimagine online teaching and learning. And there still have been you know, relatively few. Um, that's not to say there, you know, there certainly are bold and important innovations in technology that are taking place, um, but it, it, not everybody is adopting it in a meaningful and purposeful way. And that's really the difference is it's not the availability of the technology, it's how the leaders uh, actually use those, those new resources and those new technology abilities. So uh, similar to the last point, the apps available now uh, are helpful for some students in some parts of the curriculum, but not others. And that's ultimately what we see. So students who are independent, disciplined, uh, self-motivated, uh, you know, highly driven, they continue to do really well. Top performers, in some cases, thrived during the pandemic. And so schools and campuses that are filled with lots of really high performers oftentimes did pretty well because these are disciplined students who continue to have a lot of success. Um, so the, the main point here is that pedagogy is the driver, technology is the accelerator by Muckville uh, Fallen, uh, PhD's a researcher, author, and educational reformer out of uh, uh, Canada, uh, who's written uh, extensively uh, in, uh, in the area of educational uh, reform. I think this is, is very well said. Uh, and so ultimately, we can't rely on technology to be the change that we want to see in education. Ultimately, it's going to be people leading that revolution. Um, but technology can accelerate that. And that's exactly what we're focused on. And, and I do you know, applaud the efforts of the leadership at Global Schools Foundation. because I do think that the, the way that the, the organization has responded to the pandemic uh, has been with uh, you know, a forward leaning approach. And what can we do to innovate? What can we do to, you know, to be even more prepared for something Something like this in the future, and you know, what does this tell us about the needs and the gaps that exist in the marketplace? And that's something that was highlighted: is that there are major gaps in the marketplace. Um, there, you know, the technology just isn't really fully getting the job done, and that's why we're building really innovative technology that will be proprietary to the Global Schools organization, uh, and is you know is really exciting. And, we, and we're seeing some some opportunities to adapt to and support the shifting role of the teacher. And so the the teacher of tomorrow, you know, and that's when we're we're talking about schools of tomorrow. Uh, it starts with the teachers of tomorrow. And so the teachers of tomorrow, they're going to be data scientists. They're going to be connectors. Uh, they're going to be researchers. They'll be developers. They'll be counselors. And these are really, you know, the, the you know, many teachers are already doing a lot of this. But I think as technology continues to change the demands in education, change the educational landscape, uh, we'll see that it's going to be changing what the teacher does. Because as we improve efficiencies and free teachers up to do more meaningful uh, things with their with their time, um, that's going to mean they might, you know, they might not spend as much time taking attendance, and they're not going to spend as much time creating quizzes and administering those quizzes. They're going to have the data, and they'll be focused more on what do I do 
with all of these insights as opposed to how do I get this quiz out to all of the students said, let me go back and, and grade all of these. Uh, they're going to have you know, more questions because they'll have more data, more evidence to base questions and decisions on uh, in the future. And so this all leads and you know, I, I think that it's an exciting time uh, for, for GIS and the larger uh, Global Schools Foundation uh, organization uh, because we are in the process of building really modern platforms, innovative platforms that go beyond what we're seeing in the marketplace today uh, because these are really being built specifically for the needs that have been identified by already extremely high performing educators, and very high performing uh, teachers and, and uh, effective uh, leadership throughout the organization. Uh, so to be able to build something that is so human centered and so uh, highly focused on the needs that are observed every single day is a really unique opportunity and something that's that's really exciting. And, and folks like myself who have built a lot of technology products over the years and worked on the private side and, and you know, I've worked on uh, leading product development and leading businesses that were used in over 170 countries by you know, over 10 million students. Um, you have had a, a lot of opportunities to, to work on technology, but you never get to be as close to the, the problems that you're trying to solve. And you don't get to be as close to, um, to the data and the information that will help to iterate and drive a, a, an even better product in the future. And so some of the things that we're, we're working on, and we'll get into the details of the products, uh, but we'll you know, hopefully get a chance to, to give a sneak peek later on, possibly in another episode. Uh, but our focus is going to be to automate some of these repetitive tasks, to free up highly qualified, highly focused, and, and motivated individuals to get the most out of their time with the students, streamline communication um, so we're not you know, stuck to, to social media, have something that's really focused for the school, uh, find what works and then replicate. It's one of the best things technology can do and the best technology out there is doing right now. It's rapidly, you know, machine learning can be tasked with figuring out what process just worked most effectively for the most students. Let's replicate that with these students who we can tell also need that same kind of activity, that same kind of support. We'll be able to do that through a variety of adaptivity and uh, student development plans and so on. Um, identifying the student needs rapidly, personalizing uh, and accelerating learning is ultimately the goal. And so if the goal is to introduce new technology, you're going to see things stay relatively the same. You're not gonna see a whole lot of meaningful improvement. But if your goal is to radically uh, accelerate learning, to personalize the learning, not just in a way where you meet the student's preferences, but know the student's needs and uncover facts and insights about students that they didn't know, that their teachers didn't know, that no Nobody else uh, knew about those students. If you can uncover those insights and do something meaningful with those insights, now you're leveraging technology for something truly worthwhile and truly meaningful. And that's exactly what our approach is, and that's what we're focused on as part of these projects. Uh, and so as a result, we'll be supporting the whole learner, not just the learner who needs to get better at language development or in math, uh, but understanding the emotional needs of the student, the, uh, the social uh, needs of the student, and uh, ensuring that they, they are uh, they have the composure and the discipline and the, and the drive to, uh, to persist and the ability to recognize what problems are worth their attention and what problems are worth their attention despite lots of frustration and despite maybe lack of progress in a short period of time. Uh, so we're going to be uh, doing a lot of work to, to focus on these, uh, these, these six uh, areas uh, over the next uh, couple of years and, and beyond. Um, so uh, with that, you know, it's a, it's a drastically changing world, um, but I do think that we're we're seeing some exciting applications coming out. Uh, a lot of what's available just on the marketplace you know, is, is promising and exciting, but it simply isn't getting the job done. Uh, but I think you know, some of the things that, that Global School is working on um, will be truly transformative, and, and I'm excited to, to see that see that happen. And so with that, uh, thank you so much for, for giving me an opportunity to, to tell that story. I hope it was useful. I hope it was interesting, or at least parts of it were interesting to at least uh, at least portions of, of the audience. Um, and so with that, I'd be happy to, to answer any questions that, uh, that you might have. Uh, thank you, Patrick, for taking us through this entire session. Uh, it was really enlightening to see how GSF is keeping uh, pace with the changing educational trends. And I really am reminded of a quote, technology can never replace teachers, but technology in hands of great teachers can be transformational. And I could actually gel, you know, with, the, with your presentation as you were presenting, each and every slide kind of re resonated with this particular quote. 
So we are living technology and we are now transcending it. And as uh, keeping in alignment with our vision that our Mr. Chairman, Mr. Atul Demonikar says, we are not just a group of smart schools. We are trying to break smart students, smart teachers, so that we are truly smart and our pioneer for smart education. So I have one question for you. What strategies do you think we can apply to have a complete buy-in from our stakeholders in terms of ensuring that we are on right track? Any kind of change is difficult because it's oftentimes it's a it's a loss for somebody, and so you know change management is a, is a science unto itself. It's an art unto itself, and it's a, really it's its own technology, and that is you know in in my opinion one of the reasons that some of the best ideas haven't really had an opportunity to thrive and and uh, survive in 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 the world or, or grow the way that they you know, maybe had the potential to, and that's because you know change. Is, is is difficult, um, but so you know it's not impossible. There are things that you can do, and so I think uh, you know uh, there are a handful of models out there. But I think the, the first thing to do is, as the person trying to create the change and drive the change, make sure that the technology actually has a legitimate benefit, and that it isn't just another you know cool tool for your phone or or something to use your um, you know you bought all these Chromebooks, so now let's do something useful with them. Uh, you really want to think about the technology first, and really think about the human first. And so, human-centered design really will uh, steer us in the right direction every single time. If we really start with with the person, start with the problems that the human encounters throughout their day, and then understand the implementation from the perspective of that human, as opposed to from the perspective of the leader or the person trying to get technology or get some kind of change to take place. So first one, challenge yourself. Make sure that that technology has a truly legitimate benefit. Then secondly, Try to get the users to focus on the benefit and not the tools. Get everybody rallied around what we're trying to do, what the end result is going to be. Really start with the why of, of what we're trying to do. Um, and and uh, then from there, you know, listen carefully for important feedback. If you're out there delivering a session on some new technology, doing some professional development, then a couple of the teachers are saying, yeah, this isn't going to work. You know, I don't, I don't like the way this, this is working for me. Don't dismiss it and argue it, uh, you know, argue against it. Listen to it, you know, really listen to it. Take it to heart and say, OK, well, this is this is certainly true for you. Um, you know, maybe this isn't true for everybody. Maybe there's a misunderstanding. So let me see. How can I do a better job of teaching and how can I do a better job of, of truly understanding the heart of your concern and of your objection uh, and and um, you know, try to turn that into uh, you know, a, a better, a more human centered implementation and then really repeat this process until you've created a perfect world. Uh, and truly, you know, and that's, and I, I say that, you know, it might sound a little uh, grandiose in a way, but that's the goal. The goal is a perfect world. You know, utopia is what we're striving for. Mm -hmm. And we have to keep striving for that. And whatever that utopia, whatever that perfect world might be, you know, whether it's a classroom that leverages its technology well or a classroom where all the students are meeting, uh, you know, get proficiency gains. Or maybe it's a world, you know, where uh, there, you know, everybody has a reasonable opportunity to be successful and everybody is, you know, clothed and fed and sheltered, uh, you know, and successful and, and has self-agency. You know, whatever your definition of a perfect world or utopia is, we got to keep working at it. We got to follow that process uh, over and over again until we progressively get closer uh, to what might be an impossible goal, but the only goal that we uh, that we really should be aspiring. Patrick, uh, thank you very much for that very insightful presentation. My question to you is, what do you think are the emerging trends in education? And how do you think we can um, we, we make sure we are on that track? That's a, a good question. Um, you know, so there are there are in education there are there's no shortage of, of trends and some of those trends are necessary and are the kinds of things we should be focused on because they're new truths that have been discovered as a result of new new research new data uh, and ultimately a, a new world some of them are fads that are pushed by 
<laughs> technology leaders, by um, you know people in academia trying to you know get another publication out out there. Um, so you know I think it, it's important to understand you know what the real trends are, where there's consensus. And so that would be my advice: is there should always be a good amount of consensus. Um, we should see that consensus really you know globally to some extent, and from different dom- different um, uh, areas. You know, it shouldn't just be from academia or just from the private sector or just from uh, school leadership. So that's the first thing: is you know when we're looking at trends. You know, that is the main trend is there have been too many trends and too many fads in education that people have latched onto without being purposeful and really thoughtful about whether or not those trends are are worth uh, worth doing something about. Um, but I do think that some that are worth doing something about or worth paying attention to uh, are, you know, one is the focus on social and emotional learning. Something happened when people started spending a lot of time on on their devices. Um, you know, there you know, I won't go into too uh, a sociological, you know, dissertation here on the on the whole thing, mostly because I'm not a sociologist and I've never completed a dissertation. But um, but in, in any event, so we do, we did see that there's a lot of superficial interest that is uh, cultivated in our immediate sort of online uh, worlds. And so a focus on, you know, a hyper focus on likes and immediate attention and short term transactional benefits uh, has done some damage to civilization uh, as a whole and especially young people. Um, that that kind of, you know, it's nice to have instant feedback. It's nice to be connected to peers, but it's also problematic uh, when you're developing and you're trying to figure out what your view of yourself is. And when the voices of other people's views about yourself are much louder than your own, that can be problematic. So what we've ended up seeing is a, a huge need for social emotional learning supports to uh, you know, try to help kids become more comfortable uh, with themselves and know how to advocate for themselves and make sure that they're not hyper-focused on these transactional and uh, superficial kind of uh, interactions that, that take place. So uh, focusing on stuff that matters. And I, I know that sounds a little bit vague, but that's that's a major trend is a lot of stuff doesn't matter. Let's start focusing on those things that are worth our time, worth our attention. And if we're going to worry about something and stress ourselves out, it better be worthwhile. And the number of likes I got on my post on Instagram, um, that's just shouldn't be worthwhile. So that's one of the, but we got to help we have to help kids through that because these are social constructs. These are social environments. We all live through them. They just have changed and intensified with the next generation. So that's one thing. On a more, you know, kind of uh, sort of a tangible uh, thread here is another emerging trend in, in education is that creativity is not accelerating at the rate that we need it to. We have more problems that are more difficult to solve than we've really faced you know, many other times in, in history. And students are, are leaving with a lot of knowledge and they're testing really well on important high stakes tests but they're having a hard time being creative, coming up with new and unique solutions. And so we continue to see researchers finding that there's a little bit of a creativity gap. Uh, another piece, uh, another emerging technology, of course, is that there's yeah, a lot more adaptivity and personalization. Um, and so those are kind of more mainstream trends in a, in a sense. Uh, so you have more, you know, we can make changes, we can be more dynamic uh, and adjust to a student's needs more quickly and efficiently than ever before. And those are things that we really need to focus on. Um, so those, I think, are some some of the biggest trends is that we've got to focus on the social and emotional needs of learners, uh, try to make sure that the technology doesn't get in the way of building creativity. And if we can find a way to enhance creativity, problem solving, these other more important higher order thinking skills uh, with the use of technology, then we'll really be uh, onto something. Um, but yeah, in addition to that, you know, of course, artificial intelligence, machine learning, it's really just the beginning of what AI is going to do for education. And it's going to be exciting to see what that, uh, what that looks like in the next 5, 10, 20 years. Patrick, in your opinion, do you think that the online platforms that we're going to use or are using in right now? I'll go again. Um, thank you, Patrick. In your opinion, do you think the online platforms that we were, that we are using currently? Sorry, I it's okay, it's okay. Yeah, because I'm framing the question now. Okay, thank you, Patrick. Uh, in your opinion, do you think that the online platforms that we are using now, or we are exploring for our future, to what extent do they play the role in self-directed learning? for students, from students' perspective, where do you think it is going to help them in their self-directed learning? Do you think it would help them to mitigate the effect of spacing curve, how they plan, how they proceed? I would like really like to hear from you. 
Uh, sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I do think that, you know, the sort of more self-directed online environments will continue to pick up. There are going to be more opportunities. And in some ways, you know, that's a really good thing for, for all learners. Um, I don't think teachers are going to be replaced. I think there's still a need for the educational community. And however that community can take shape, whether that's in person or through a, you know, a virtual community or a school, a remote school community, um, you know, however we can ensure there's community in place, that's, you know, that's really what, what matters. Um, but I do think, you know, that, that the role you know, will for the long term um, is going to be for kind of upskilling. You know, that's the place for a lot of these kind of open online environments is, you know, learning some fairly discrete skills. And that's why micro credentials are really popular in that space because you go online, not necessarily, although there are, of course, online bachelor's degree programs and master's programs and even PhDs and, and so on. So you can do this completely online, but they tend to have a pretty good community infrastructure as well through mentorship and peer learning and so on. Um, so I, I think that you know there, there is a, a huge need for peer learning. That's that's extremely important, especially in language development and creativity problem solving. Um, people need to come together. People have always come together. We are a social um, you know group. Uh, humans are are very social by by nature and through our you know through nurture over over time. We've built a lot of institutions uh, that assume that people are going to to work together to to solve problems. So I think that there's certainly a place for online environments and for online learning. Um, but I don't, I don't think that the future of education is a, is an isolated, solitary online activity. Um, I think you can, you know, I, I, I was able to learn, I earned some badges and some programming languages during the pandemic, which was nice, but I didn't learn it nearly to the extent that I would have had I been at a top computer science program or working with senior engineers and for folks to look at my code and let me know that, Hey, this is where it could be more efficient. There's a lot that I was missing. So I can do it. I can pass a test. But can I really design an application and build, you know, code, truly code an application the way a senior engineer would? The answer is no. And I never will be able to without the feedback from somebody who, uh, not my position anyway, is that without the feedback from somebody who's there, who cares about you enough to, to give you some feedback and, and nurture your needs, um, uh, and nurture your development. Um, I do think that in the the future still involves people working with other people, being supported by other people, and then working on some things on their own. And that mix might change over time, but I do think the future is a. So, Mr. Patrick, with the advent of technologies in education, it's becoming uh, more and more difficult for students to stay on track or stay focused. There are so many distractions. So uh, how do you think, Patrick, in the future, um, and even now, uh, we can help the students to um, better focus and uh, stay away from the distractions? That's, that's a great question. And I think if we figure out the solution for students, let's make sure to tell all the adults all about it too, because <laughs> they are suffering from the same exact thing. Uh, so, you know, it is, it, while, you know, it, it's our job to worry about, you know, kids who are under our, our guidance and uh, stewardship uh, as, as educators. Um, but we also, you know, we should take a look at ourselves and take a look at the, the people and the adults around us. Um, this is, we're just in a highly transactional, um, again, you know, to perhaps overusing sort of superficial uh, state of affairs right now where uh, news stories have, you know, become boiled down to a headline and a couple of a couple of lines. And for the most part, if the position seems to be consistent with your position, then great, you accept it as fact. And if it's different, then you just proclaim that it's that's not a fact. Um, you know, that's that that's fake, uh, for example. So I think that, you know, what we what we really need to do is bring back uh, nuance you know, let's let's make um, let's make depth uh, cool again. And you know, so how do we how do we do that? You know, you look at our our the technologies have emphasized um, very very short um, snippets of the world. And I think anything that's meaningful and long lasting is a result of somebody really uh, tirelessly focusing on on that, whether that's a d depth in a relationship. Um, you know, if our relationships had to be focused to 140 characters at a time, we wouldn't have great, you know, caring, loving relationships with the people around us. Uh, and if your career was, you know, was broken down into a series of, you know, um, photographs uh, without, you know, any context or description of, of 
of what was going on, you know, you wouldn't have a very uh, enriching career and we wouldn't have, you know, cured any diseases or, or anything like that. So I, I think that as long as we are, you know, in a, as long as the world continues to go towards shorter durations of consumption and really focusing on, on just consumption over depth and over value, uh, then I think we're going to, we're going to have a hard time. So the task for me would be to, you know, what I would do is, is just actively go against that and require activities that, that force students in a sense that require long periods of concentration and very long periods of, of reflection and thought and introspection, and also teach that whatever position you came up with, so now take, you know, take an hour, take two hours, come up with the best argument in favor of this policy that you can possibly come up with. Now take another two hours and come up with the opposite. Come up with an argument against that policy. Then come in afterwards and now try to figure it out. And now you're the judge or the arbiter. You've got to figure out, you know, where that truth is somewhere in between. So I think we need to focus on 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 nuance, on depth and the complexity of issues so that we don't end up in a very short term transactional black and white thinking uh, world that's going to help people become more evaluative, to become more critical uh, and to really, you know, uh, become you know creative and, and learn how to you know do all of the things that we want to see in, in education. Um, so I think those are some of the things that I would. And so by having activities that require depth and persistence, that's going to you know, kids will get students will get pretty good at, at eliminating distractions if they they have to. Uh, and honestly, you know, Put your phone on on silent. Have a couple of people who, if there's an emergency, their phone calls will come through to you. Otherwise, put your phone on do not disturb. That's probably the simplest thing you can do. Turn your notifications off. Uh, get rid of all the badge alerts on your phone, um, for the most part. You know, and and uh, make put yourself make make sure that you're the one who decides to go and consume content. Um, don't let your phone tell you what you're supposed to do next. So that would be probably the simplest thing that I could recommend. So looking at this and our discussion today, can we say that online learning, blended learning, hybrid models or open classes is actually the future of education, what we call smart education? Yeah, great question. Um, and I think this is, you know, fairly with some of the other, uh, you know, points points that we've we've discussed. I, I think that the, the future is, is blended. Uh, it really is because it's, we need people around us. We're we're social beings, and we don't do well uh, without other people around us. The pandemic has has shown that. I mean, we've seen every every you know. It, it, there's some things like car accidents aren't as frequent now because people aren't driving, but um, things like anxiety disorders and, and depression are, you know, are, are, are getting much higher in parts all over the world. Um, in some cases, you know, at alarming at alarming rates. So uh, I, I think that um, people need other people and not just to be around, but to be challenged by. Uh, and to be, you know, cared for, uh, and we also need other people to care about. Uh, and so, so I think that uh, everything we do in education is really about improving the human condition, ultimately. And so, you know, we're um, if we take the human aspect out of that, then we will lose sight of what we're trying to do here in the first place. Education is inherently a humanitarian objective. Uh, and it's not just about giving them the skills so they can earn a good salary. It's about giving them skills and giving perspective and giving students a voice and teaching them how to think about the world, not to think in a certain way, but how to you know uh, extend their thinking through uh, projects to converge their thinking at times when you need to get to a decision, diverge your thinking when you need more creativity. And it's people who challenge that better, better than anybody else. Now, chatbots are getting pretty good and AI might get just as good at another person or as a, as a friend, but still enjoying that with just your bot friends. Maybe that's the future. I hope not. If it does, I hope it's after my time uh, because I, you know, I, I, if all, if all of my friends are robots, I'm not sure how happy I'm going to be, to be honest. Uh, that's not all that scientific, but that's I think that's the best I can come up with, is that I don't want to live in a world where my only friends are robots. As humans, we need that human touch, that human interaction, that feeling of being socially, emotionally, emotionally and mentally well. Okay, um, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Patrick. It's been a pleasure to have you here.
with this question, uh, we will wrap up the first episode of GIS webinar series. Once again, we are really thankful to you, uh, Mr. Patrick, and to our viewers for joining in and making time for this uh, in their busy schedule today. Thanks so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. Do look out for our second episode, which will be airing very soon on IT skills that we are inculcating in our primary learners so that they are ready to be global digital citizens of tomorrow. Till then, bye.